The materials used in this project are available from Jameco Electronics. Previously on Circuit Skills. The first board is definitely more sturdy, but I found the layout process to be kind of confusing. So finally, I did try etching, and I loved it. I could lay out yeah, the circuit well, the way I wanted. Etching's fun and all, but it's not always convenient. When I don't have time to do a proper layout, I'm back to good old perforated board. It's pretty much the quickest way to solder up a working project. Perf boards available in a bunch of different types. Uh, the most common being pad per hole, which has one solderable pad around each hole, so it's well named. Other styles are available with pads spanning across multiple holes. These longer lines are great for bussing ground and supply voltage to multiple parts. These rows of shorter segments allow for easy access to IC pins. And strip board, as it's called, is just all parallel copper lines, which can be cut to custom lengths. I've built quite a few things on perf board or proto board as it's sometimes known. Most of them work. Maybe not this one, but overall, a pretty good amount of success. The cool thing about perf board is that it's permanent and sturdy, but there's all these extra pads all over that I could add something on with. I pretty much use it when I want to solder something up now, or really soon. Example. When I run across an interesting guitar effect on the web, and I really want to try it, but I don't want to build it on breadboard because I might really like it and then want to keep it, and anything that I put on a breadboard I'm pretty much going to have to pull off at some time. Anyway, yeah, that's when I use perfboard. In fact, I have just happened to come across a circuit like that I'd like to try. This here is Tim Escobedo's design for a guitar effect he calls PWM, which stands for Pulse Width Modulation. His schematic uses practical pinout diagrams for the ICs, which is helpful when actually building the circuit. But to compare, I drew up a more conventional version using all standard symbols. The most obvious change is to the 40106 chip which is now represented by its functional components, six separate Schmidt triggers. So, let's go turn this schematic into hardware. First off, I'll stake out some prime real estate for my chips and solder in their sockets. Just a couple of pins at first, I'll solder the rest once I'm totally sure that's where I want them. While following along with the schematic, I'll arrange each part so that they can easily be connected to one another. Conveniently enough, a lot of connections can be made simply by bending a part lead in the right direction. So far it looks like this layout will work, so now I can solder in my parts.
The diode's thick cathode lead comes in handy for delivering power to both of my ICs. Small unwanted bridges can usually be cleared by simply running the iron's tip between each pad. After a bit more work, I was able to make nearly all of the onboard connections using only the component leads I had on hand. For the remaining few, I'll use some solid core wire as jumpers on the top side of the board. Flexible stranded type wire is your best bet for hooking up external parts. Melting and smooshing down a small amount of the wire's insulator at the solder joint can even provide a little bit of strain relief. A spot of hot glue would probably do even better. Using a variety of wire colors helps me keep track of the connections for each potentiometer and jack. Once all the offboard parts are soldered, I'll pop the ICs into their sockets, connect my battery, And we are ready for testing. Not bad for just a couple chips and a handful of parts, huh? It was so quick to build, in fact, that I might just go put something else together. Like a uh, delay to go with this, maybe? Want to check out the PWM effect for yourself? Build it with parts from Jamco Electronics.